you to lift up our voices and praising the name of Jesus.
Would the ushers please come forward who are going to help uh, distribute the communion elements? And we invite this morning anyone who has received Jesus Christ into their lives as their Lord and Savior. We ask you and just welcome you to join us at the communion table. A large church in London had three mission churches that have been established or are planted in some of the most crime-infested and the most poverty-stricken neighborhoods in the entire city of London. And through those mission churches, a lot of desperate lives had been found uh, and saved and found these people had found new life in Jesus Christ. And on the first Sunday of the new year, they had a tradition where all the members of all these, these three mission churches, everybody would come together for, uh, to the mother church there in the center of, of London for a joint communion service. And there at the communion rail, then everyone would come up and they, they'd kneel side by side to receive communion. Now, in one of those services, there at the communion rail were kneeling side by side a former burglar who had spent seven years in jail and a judge of the Supreme Court of England, the actual judge who had sent that burglar to prison. So the former burglar had come to one of these mission churches, and they had they had uh, you know become a Christian, and uh, and it was an exciting thing. His life was just dramatically changed. So there they were, you know, the two, the, the Supreme Court judge and the, the criminal, the former convict, just kneeling side by side at the communion rail. Now after the service, the judge was walking home with the pastor of the church, and the judge said. Did you notice who was kneeling beside me at the communion rail this morning? And the pastor said, yes, I did. And they walked along a little further and the judge said, what a miracle of grace. And the pastor nodded in agreement and he said, what a miracle indeed. And they went on a few more minutes and the judge suddenly stopped and said, wait, wait a minute, uh, whose conversion are you talking about? The pastor said, well, the conversion of the, of the convict, of course. He said, no, 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 no. I wasn't talking about him. I was talking about me. My conversion. And he went on to explain, you know, that burglar, it's not so hard to believe that he would come to Christ. I mean, he came out of jail and he had nothing but, you know, a history of crime behind him. He had no, not, not much of a future ahead of him. And he was so down, he had to look up. When he heard about Jesus, he knew how desperately he needed him in his life. But not me. I grew up with every advantage imaginable. I was raised in an, an affluent family. I went to the finest of schools. And I, I said my prayers every night as far back as I can remember. And as from early as I can remember, I have been taught the difference between right and wrong. I grew up and became a, a successful lawyer and then a judge. Pastor, he said, nothing but the grace of God could have caused me to see that I was a sinner on the same level as that burglar. I'm convinced that it took a whole lot more grace for God to save me than him. It took more grace of God to break through the ugliness of my self-righteous pride and my self-deception to get me to see that in God's eyes I was no closer to heaven than that convict that I had sent to jail. God's grace is amazing. Isn't it? No matter who you are, whether stock boy or stock broker, you know, whether you're a notorious sinner or you're just a church-going saint, whoever you are, wherever you are on the spectrum of good and bad, at the foot of the cross, all of us stand on equal level ground. Whether we realize it or not, we are all in desperate need of the grace of God. Well, communion is a penetrating object lesson that Jesus crafted to serve as a continual reminder of the incredible grace that God showed you and me in letting His Son, Jesus, come to earth and die this horrible death for our sins. To die so that our sins, no matter how many, no matter how few, could be forgiven and we could have a relationship with Him. Now, we're going to do communion the way we did it. Last week, we want you to come forward when I tell you to and, and get the, the communion elements. 
And then take them back to your seat and immediately go ahead and, and eat the bread and drink the juice. Now, because that bread, of course, represents the broken body of Christ on the cross. The juice represents the blood that, that washes away our sins. So after you return to your seat and you eat the, the, the bread and drink the juice, I want you to just quietly think and just quietly meditate uh, as Jordy and the, and the worship team is from playing. Meditate about God's grace in saving you and the difference it's made in your life. Think about that. And think about somebody that you really care about. Somebody that doesn't know Christ personally yet, with whom you would love to share the gospel of God's grace. Ask God, God, give me the grace. Give me the strength. Give me the courage. Give me the opportunity to share with that person. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as Jordan begins to play, when you're ready, just come on up, get the elements, and return to your seat. And think about those things.
owe all to you, God. So, Father, we come before you this morning offering our praise and our worship as we remember, as we remember what your Son has done for us, as we remember the price that was paid for the redemption of our sins, as we remember the price that was paid so that we can have eternal life and spend eternity with you, our God and our Savior. So, Father, we just ask, Lord, that in this moment that you would continue to draw us closer to you. Father, that you continue to pull us in. And, God, that you would speak to us through the reading of your word, through the preaching of your message. Father, that you would give us a heart to receive the message of grace this morning. So, Father, we praise you and we thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. All in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Notice how far away the glasses is. <laughs> Not going to happen again. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of problems with religion. I mean, think about it. The history of religion, it's downright embarrassing. There, there's all kinds of horrible things that have been done in the name of religion. <clears throat> You've got the Spanish Inquisition, where in the name of God, they would arrest and torture people if they used the wrong kind of wafer in communion. In the 7th century, you've got Muslims persecuting and mur murdering Jewish people saying, God wills it, God wills it. And then you've got the Crusades that took place in the Middle Ages, and where Pope Urban you know, tells Christians to wipe out all the Muslims in the Holy Land. It's basically an ethnic cleansing kind of deal. And catch this, they promised that every person who signed up to go on a crusade, or, or even was on the way to go a crusade, would have immediate remission of their sins. And so people thought, noblemen and different people went on, hey, this is great. You know, most of the sermons back there were hellfire and damnation. You know, hey, this is great. If I go on this crusade, I, I, I can just sin like crazy and still go to heaven. Isn't that great? And so they did it just that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, they send their way all through France, all through through Germany, and they, until they got to Constantinople, and they they you know murdered about a thousand or so Jews, and they went on down to Jerusalem and just murdered every Muslim in sight and took over the city. And they're thinking, hey, we can do whatever we want. I'm on crusade. You know, my sins have been absolved. I I, I can just I can gonna go to heaven no matter what. So I can just live any old way I want. Wow. Religion has a lot of problems. But it's not just back then, okay? It's also now in our era, too. Today, in the name of religion, you know, sometimes we get some really goofy stuff. You know, it just kind of borders on the superstitious and all that. You know, one, one morning, some, some gal so cooks some pancakes, and she's cooking on and she flips that can. And there is the face of Mary in the pancake, okay? And, and, and suddenly, people are lining up for blocks for a mile long to see Mary of the pancake. And, and that's just kind of goofy, and it? I mean, sometimes it's just really strange. And, and how did they know it was Mary anyway? I mean, there were no photographs, there were no pictures. Maybe it was Debbie. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was Liz. I, and we just don't know. But on a much more serious note, you know, more devastating note, today, you know, religious leaders who have been have, have abused their position and, and authority and have, have done sexual things to little boys and girls and, and getting away with it was just like a slap on the wrist. And today we have all kinds of televangelists who, who get on TV and guilt people into sending them millions of dollars which they use to buy for themselves huge mansions. Just not one or two, but lots of mansions. And they buy corporate jets and Rolls Royces and, and Bentleys and on and on. And all that's done in the name of religion. Consequently... Looking at some of the crazy, off-the-wall things that go on in religions, a lot of people are just turned off by religion. And they just kind of think, man, if that's what religion is all about, I want nothing to do with it. Well, guess what? If you feel that way, you 
happen to be in very good company because Jesus was turned off by religion too. And whenever you pull out your Bible and you start reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the Gospels, and, and you just kind of see that Jesus is in this kind of running gun battle with the religious leaders of his day. And the scribes and the Pharisees, what had happened? They had completely distorted and perverted the Jewish faith. And what they've done is they've taken, you know, all the Old Testament laws and they've added to those laws hundreds and hundreds of additional laws of ways to obey those original laws. And you'd have to do those things where you couldn't really be righteous. And the Pharisees, you know, they started off well intended enough, but they quit focusing on loving God and having a relationship with Him. And they got fixated on self righteously keeping all these rules and all these regulations. And consequently, they became very religious. And they thought that, you know, that, that they followed the rules better than anybody else. And they looked down on people they considered less righteous than they were. And, and they thought because they were so outwardly good, because on the outside, externally looked so good, that surely God accepted them. And they just loved the adoration of the crowds. They loved people thinking, oh, there goes that Pharisee. He is so righteous. He's so good. He's so holy. And consequently, the Pharisees would hide their horrendous sins that they knew were inside. And consequently, they were giant hypocrites. And these are the men who killed Jesus. And this really, this whole religiosity just turned Jesus off. In fact, the harshest things Jesus ever said were directed at these very religious leaders. In Matthew 23, boy, that's a blistering, blistering account. And Jesus just blasts. I mean, no holds barred. He just blasts him saying some incredible things. I'll, I'll read a couple of them to you. Not the whole part, but you get the picture. Jesus says, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the far more important matters of the law, like justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, you blind guys. You strain out a gnat, you tend to all these nitpicky little rules, but you swallow a camel, you miss the big things, the most important things. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. Okay, in our area, we know about whitewashed tombs, okay? We've got them here. Uh, you're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. He goes on to call you brutal vipers. Whoo! They were very religious, but they were very lost. They're religious, but they had no relationship with God. And so the truth is, in order to find God, you have to lose your religion. But what is religion? What am I talking about religion? You know, there's some good religions, man religion, but religion is basically that it's trying to do good things. It's trying to not do bad things in order, here's the catch, you're doing that all stuff in order to gain God's favor. In order to cause God to love you because of all the good stuff you're doing. In order to earn His approval. And according to what the Bible teaches us, religion doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You will never, ever find God that way. So we kind of need to cut through some of the religious baloney out there and, and that, that sometimes just get piled on and piled on to, to, to real Christianity. And we need to kind of just cut through all that and just... Focus on Jesus. And you need to listen to what he has to say about what it means to come to know God and how to believe in God and in following him. So what we want to do this morning, we want to see that the way to find God is through the gospel according to Jesus. 
And we're going to look at a lot of different verses, but the main verse we're going to look at is just one short, brief verse, John chapter 10, verse 9. And these words in John 10, 9, it just kind of beautifully summarizes the heart and soul of the message. And in this verse, we see the gospel according to Jesus. So first of all, then we see that Jesus is the one and only way to heaven. Here's what Jesus says in John 10, 9. I am the gate. Some translations say I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, in John 10, just understand what's going on here. This whole chapter is talking figuratively about how Jesus is the good shepherd. Remember Psalm 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is saying he is the shepherd of God's people. Now, back in the, uh, the, the times of the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, you know, out in the pasture where the sheep were, uh, the, the shepherds had the, uh, this kind of enclosure, a big pen, where they could keep the, the sheep in and where they could come in uh, and, and rest during the night, that kind of thing. And the shepherd, there's only one entrance. There's one, one little place where you could go in and out of this uh, the sheep pen. And the shepherd would stand right there where they're going at, or at night he'd lie down over that place, and he served as the gate. He served as the door. And the sheep can only get into the safety of the pen by going through the shepherd. Okay? So Jesus uses this picture of shepherding, a, a, a picture, something that all of his audiences who are listening were very, very familiar with, and he says, I, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And Jesus is clearly saying that he is the one and only way to heaven. And that the only way to God was through him. A few chapters later, in a very familiar uh, uh, John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Same phrase, through me. See, Jesus didn't just come to teach us a way. He said, I am the way. And he didn't come to just teach us truth. He says, I actually am the truth. And he didn't come to tell us about life. He came to give us life, abundant life, eternal life. As the great uh, theologian Karl Barth said, Jesus does not give recipes that show the way to God as other teachers of religion do. He is himself the way. Now, <clears throat> come on, let's get rid of this. This really bothered people when they, you know, when Jesus is on the way to jump, jump, but nobody can come through. I mean, they're the one to pick up stones and, and, and kill him, you know. Because so, to make this claim, I am the only way anybody can get to heaven, that is an, out, an absolutely outrageous claim for anybody to make. Unless that person was in fact the Son of God. Unless that person was in fact God incarnate. God in the flesh who had no beginning and no end. It would be a crazy, outrageous claim to say you're the only way to heaven unless that person happened to be the Messiah who, who, who was, his coming was, was predicted in prophecies and he perfectly fulfilled in, in precise and detailed ways uh, his coming. And the prophecies that were written hundreds of years before he was born. You know, you can't make that kind of claim, you know, unless you have lived a perfect life. It would be an outrageous claim unless that person performed astounding miracles. Not one or two or three, but, but many, many who were attested to by thousands of people. Inexplicable. I mean, on a scale of one to ten, ten kind of miracles. Unless that person who made this outrageous claim, unless he was predicted his own death and resurrection and then was buried in a tomb dead for three days and then he rose from the dead and gloriously reappeared to over 500 different people over a period of 40 days, you know, uh, unless you make a claim like that, you know, you better not make a claim like that. Well, Jesus did all of that. And what that means is that therefore... Unlike any other religious leader in the history of the world, he's got the credentials to say, that, yes, I'm it. I'm the only way you can come and get to heaven. 
And so Peter, one of the disciples, you know, that, that was there for the entire three years of Jesus' ministry, he witnessed all these miracles and he heard all that Jesus had to say and he saw him dead on the cross and he saw him victoriously risen. He confidently states in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Okay, that's the first part of the gospel according to Jesus. He's the only way. Next thing that is really critical to understanding the gospel according to Jesus is this. Is that the only gospel is the gospel of grace alone through faith alone. See, the Apostle Paul, you know, he went on all these missionary journeys and he established all these different churches, different places, you know, as people came to faith in Christ. And uh, inspired by God, you know, he, he taught them that, hey, listen, nobody's good enough to be saved. In fact, all of us, every single human being ever born has fallen way, 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 way short of making it into heaven because nobody's perfect. Nobody's been perfectly good. And that is why Jesus came. He came to pay for all of our sins so that we wouldn't have to be separated from God forever. And that the way that we get this forgiveness of sin, this free gift, all we have to do is receive it by faith. By simply believing, by trusting in who Jesus was, what He did, and just saying, Come into my life, God. Be my Savior. That's it. See, salvation, listen, it's not a matter of working in order to be accepted by God. It's not a matter of deserving it in any way because nobody deserves it. It's by grace alone through faith alone. But here's what happened. After Paul, you know, established his churches, you know, he's in Galatia, along come these, these Jewish guys who claim that they've become Christians, and they're known as the Judaizers. And they come into the, the, uh, the Galatian towns and say, oh, we're so glad you've become believers. You know, glad, you know, you've accepted Jesus. That's all great. But Paul didn't really give you the whole story, you know, in order to really be saved, and really to be righteous, you really be approved by God, you have to do all the things in the Old Testament that the Jewish people do. I know you're Gentiles, but you know, you got to do all this. You got to kind of become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And you got to obey all the Jewish laws and you got to eat certain foods, just kosher stuff. And, and I hate to say it, guys, but you're growing in, you're going to have to be circumcised, you know, if you want to go to heaven. And you have to do all the Jewish feasts and all this. And what they were doing, here's what they're doing. They were adding requirements to how you get to heaven. That is a no-no. That, that's just something you cannot do. So Paul, man, he catches wind of, of this and he is hot. I mean, these are his sheep. You know, these are the people he's led to the Lord. And he's a stand. Here these guys come along and trying to mess up the whole thing. So he writes them a little letter. And he's a little ticked off. He's righteously ticked off. But he is ticked off. And here's what, here's what Paul says in Galatians 1. I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one you called you by the grace of Christ. See that grace of Christ. Uh, and are turning to a different gospel. Which really, it's no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But listen, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. I.e., let him go to hell. That, that's, that's what he's saying. And these words, inspired by God, that God has preserved for us today, they are a strong, a clear, unambiguous <clears throat> words. The true gospel, the gospel according to Jesus, is that the only thing we need for eternal life is to believe in Jesus. Everybody knows John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever should believe in Him should not perish. Well, in John 6, somebody asked Jesus, Well, what works? What do we need to do, Jesus? What do we need to do? In verse 29 it says, Well, the work of God is this, to believe the one He sent. But these Judaizers, you know, they're adding works as requirements for salvation. And church, that is not the gospel. That is a dog that won't hunt. This is a different gospel, which is no gospel. No gospel means good news. This is bad news. It's not good news. It's a terrible perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that perverted, that distorted gospel of works 
tragically, it will save nobody. Nobody. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we tell, talk about it all the time. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, doing things, trying to do things to get God to love you. Not by works so that nobody can boast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know that Jesus paid for all my sins. You know, I, but, but come on, I still have to do some things to be worthy, right? To, to kind of get in. and I, I've got to kind of chip in and do my part to add to what Jesus did. And then together, man, maybe I'll get in, right? Wrong. No, that is precisely the point. Grace says Jesus did it all. There's nothing else we can do. All other religions, we've talked about this before, and all other religions are basically spelled D-O, do. you got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, all that kind of thing, D-O, okay? Christianity, boy, this is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world because according to Jesus, you know, it's not spelled D-O, it's spelled D-O-N-E, done. It is done. Jesus has done it all. That's what grace is about, guys. That's the grace of the gospel. And listen, if you try to add works to grace to be saved, you destroy grace. It's no longer grace. You know, grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor from God. There's not one thing you can do to get it. He just gives it to you. You just receive it by faith. Now listen, look, this is a... Incredible verse. Romans eleven six. 6. Paul's talking about salvation. And, and, and he says this. And if by grace, if salvation is by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. You see, see, uh, grace and works are kind of mutually exclusive. It's either by works, it's stuff that you do to earn your salvation, or it's by grace. It's what God does. It can't be both works and grace. The only gospel the one true gospel, the gospel according to Jesus, the one gospel that's going to get you to heaven is the gospel of grace alone plus faith alone. Okay, here's something else that's really important about the gospel according to Jesus. Here it is. See on your outline. The true gospel opens the door to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. True gospel opens the door to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Back to John 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved through me. Get that? Not through my teaching. Not through my church. Not through knowing a lot about the Bible. But through me. Through me. It's a personal relationship. Later on in the chapter, Jesus says, you know, in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I, what? Know my sheep. And what about the sheep? They know me. In the upper room, you know, the night before Jesus was crucified, he's praying for the church. He's praying for the disciples and you and me. And he prays in John 17, 3. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may, what? Know you, the only true God, and know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So knowing Jesus, having a personal uh, knowledge of him, a, a personal relationship with him, that's what it's all about. Now, listen to this. This is a little scary. Isn't it interesting that in Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about who's going to make it into the kingdom and who's not going to make it into the kingdom? Listen to what he says. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly. Okay, what does he say? Well, what's the reason why you, you know he can their, their will will not go to heaven? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. <coughs> never knew you. See, guys, we're not talking about church membership. We're, not, we're you know, back in the third century, there was this heresy that started that said, hey, there's no salvation outside of the church. And in other words, if you were not on the rolls, if you were not a recognized member of the church, you, you couldn't go to heaven. And it started out okay, but you know, as the years went by throughout the history of the church, salvation became not so much a matter of having your heart in the right place with Jesus as much as having your paperwork in order. 
Okay? Now, some people today, they have that, that, that same kind of attitude. They say, you know, okay, well, I'm a Christian because I was baptized the right way. I don't remember it, but I was baptized the right way. I'm a Christian because I went through a class and I got confirmed, you know, went to the baptism class with the pastor and, and, and I, I got confirmed. Or I'm a Christian because I filled out a card at, the, at this tent revival thing and I filled out a card and, you know, you know and that, that was a long time ago. But hey, I'm, I'm a Christian. Guys, being a Christian is not about paperwork. It has nothing to do with that. It's about a personal relationship with Christ. It's about Knowing him, not knowing about him, it's about knowing him. You know, I know a lot of information about Julie Jemison over there. I know where she was born. I know what color eyes she has. I know she makes the best brownies in the universe. Can I have an amen on that? But I don't just know about Julie. I know Julie. I know her tender heart. I know how she feels about God. And I know if I'm with, I know what's bothering her if I'm with her for two seconds. I can just see. I know it's fine. I know her so well. I know the heartache she experienced of walking through the valley of the, the death of her firstborn child. I know the joy she's experiencing over having her first grandson. We have been married coming up in August 43 years. And we have a close, we have a deep, we have a personal relationship with each other. That's a relationship. That's not just knowing about it. That's a relationship. And that's what Jesus wants with you. He, he, he wants you to know Him personally. Not just know a lot of Bible facts. Know Him personally. What do you think the Number one priority in the Christian life is. Is it being good? No, that's, that's important. Is it being doctrinally sound? That's, you need to do that. Is it knowing all the facts about the Bible? Well, we do need to know the Word. Is it about going to church every Sunday? Yeah, that's important. To to is it about witnessing to a lot of people? That's a great commission. That's important. What's the number one priority in the Christian life? Well, the Apostle Paul knew what was important to him. He knew what was number one for him, and, and I think what he thinks is probably pretty true for you and me as well. You see, Paul, uh, he was a type A personality if there ever was one. I mean, he, he, he was just, he was he had accomplished a lot. He was a go-getter with a tremendous drive. He was a Pharisee man. He rose to the top. He was voted in 34 AD as the most zealous Pharisee of the year. Not really. But he could have been. I mean, if they had a vote, he probably would have gotten it. He obeyed the Jewish laws better than anybody else. He had accomplished a lot. He had power. He had fame. He had position. He was highly esteemed and respected and admired by the Jewish community. But then, Paul met Jesus one day, and all that changed. All that changed. In Philippians 3, he, he writes about what became the new number one priority of his life. He says, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. And then the final part of the gospel according to Jesus is personally knowing Jesus as your Savior, you learn to walk in step with Him day by day. Walk in step with Him day by day. Back to John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now, what's that talk? What's this coming in and going out? You know, sheep would come in and out of that little enclosure and stuff. You know, they go through Jesus and all. But, but the going in, I, I think it's talking about going in to be with Jesus. And you're going into that, that sheep pen. It's His sheep pen. And you spend, spend time with Him. That's when you go in with Him and you, and you, and you worship. Like you've been worshiping this morning. And, and you, when you pray to Him and talk to Him. And when you 
read His Word and let Him talk to you and through meditation and through fellowship with other believers, that, that's going, going in, coming into Christ. Going out is us going out into the world to serve Him. When you go to work, you're going out to be His representative in this dark, broken world. When you step foot on your school campus, you are going out into the world to be His representative. When you spend an evening with friends, you go to a movie, whatever, you're going out as a Christ follower. And then when you go out, those are the times when we, when we show compassion to people in need. You know, those are the times when we show mercy to people who don't usually get mercy and probably don't deserve it. And, and that's the time when we speak truth to people who, who do not believe in truth. And going out is, is to show what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ in your sphere of influence. Uh, with those people who are looking, perhaps desperately, to find some kind of sense, some kind of meaning, some kind of purpose in their life. But you're going out, that's just not going to be all very effective if you're not going in. We're not spending time, not just to have a little quiet time and check it off for the day. Oh, money, let's check off here. No, you're going, you're going in to, to spend time with Jesus and, and just to get to know Him better, to fall in love with Him more deeply. You know, some of you here this morning may listen to this message and, and you know, it's kind of dawning. You kind of come to the real, realization that, you know, I've got religion, but I'm not sure about this personal relationship thing. Some of you may be listening today and you may have come to the realization that you've been fighting a frustrating, exhausting, losing battle of trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and failing to be good enough to make it to heaven. And to you, if you are frustrated that way, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, directly to your heart, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened by all these pharisaical walls and, and legalistic requirements. Come to me. Come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you here today may have listened to this message and come to the realization that I know about Jesus, but I can't really say that I know Jesus personally. Well, wherever you are, I would like to just for us just to lower the lights right now. And, uh, and you know, wherever you are in, in your relationship with Christ, I want to conclude our time together just listening to this, this song. Uh, it's called Knowing You, Jesus. Way back, I remember hearing this song for the first time at our Promise Keepers. It rocked me. It just, it is right out of what history. It's like Paul put to music that passage we read. Listen to it and just think about it where you are right now in relationship with Jesus.
you next week we are actually starting a whole long series on the book of revelation a lot of questions a lot of things it's not just going to be pie in the sky we say how does this apply to our everyday life so i encourage you don't miss it be here next week for week one of the apocalypse 